Valve hosted a stream targeted at Steam Deck developers to give them the information they need to know to develop for the Steam Deck appropriately. I sat through the 4 hour stream and compiled 10 things that we didn't know about the Steam Deck that gamers will want to know. Let's jump right into it. Number 1. You can build a home version today. Valve made a point to tell developers that there are not enough dev kits to send one to every developer that may want one today. So in lieu of being able to get a dev kit, they showed what sort of machine developers can build today in order to test compatibility and performance of their games. While I'm not expecting, nor suggesting, that consumers go out and build this, I have included links to what you would need in the description and in a pinned comment. The summary is this, in order to build what they're calling a hack and deck, you would need three parts and an operating system that is somewhat similar to SteamOS 3.0. For the operating system, they suggest Manjaro Linux using KDE Plasma. This is actually what I've been using for my testing since it is a very popular Arch-based distro. The first part you'll need is a controller. Steam supports every major controller including DualShock 4, DualSense, Xbox, Switch, and of course the now discontinued Steam controller. They use a DualShock 4 as an example that's both affordable and close to the controls you would have available on the deck itself. The second thing you need is a 7 inch display that is either 720p or 800p. This would help you test both the resolution and the font sizes. And the last thing you need is a mini PC with a comparable APU. They indicated that they argued internally over what kind of APU would be both available and comparable to what's in the Steam Deck. They landed on a 3750H. The host of this segment said that the GPU in the 3750H is a bit weaker and the CPU is a bit stronger than what's in the Steam Deck. Again, while I don't expect most gamers to go out and build one of these while they wait for their Steam Deck, I do expect that we'll see YouTubers like ETA Prime use this or something similar to it as a test bench in order to showcase how games will play on the Steam Deck. The only caveat there is that emulation is usually CPU bound and so we might see that emulation performs better on the test bench than it does on the Steam Deck. Sound off in the comments if you'd like me to do testing like this. I might be able to test using a mini PC that has a 4800U. Number 2. The APU was optimized for PC handheld gaming. Most of the time that APUs like this are built, they are to be placed in a laptop or even a mini PC like what I mentioned earlier. That is to say, they are just a more power efficient version of a traditional personal computing chip. Personal computing operating systems and chips are intended for, well, personal usage. This means that the chip is designed to operate at both lower clock rates and higher clock rates depending on the need at the time. The difference with the Steam Deck is that this chip is built in mind with sustaining high clock rates over long periods of time. Everything is done to keep the GPU clock running as high as possible for as long as possible. The APU runs very cool, but even if you're playing on a hot summer day and the processor begins to overheat, it will look to throttle everything else like your charge rate and SSD bandwidth before it lowers the GPU clock. It's also designed for an extremely low power draw and thermal output with a TDP that would be between 4 and 15 watts. Not only could different games run at different power profiles, but the APU has an automated power management system that could adjust the power draw mid-frame. For example, if the frame rate is capped, which it will be, but more on that later, if the frame rate is capped and the game is done rendering the frame early, the power will automatically adjust the remaining milliseconds until the next frame needs to be processed. This combination of high performance with maximum battery life is why Valve felt they needed to partner with someone like AMD to make a chip that is completely tailor-made to suit the deck. Number 3. The new UI looks great. Everything about the UI is being redesigned to not only suit handheld and TV usage, but also to streamline finding the things that many players would be interested in getting to, especially players coming from consoles that are used to having things like notifications and friends within arm's reach at all times. The new home screen compiles information from your library, friends, and a store all in one place. Likewise, the universal search feature does a search in all those places as well. No more having to search your library from one screen and a store from another. Notifications are unified and look a lot cleaner and are just a literal button press away at all times. The best part is that under the hood they are merging the code bases for big picture mode and desktop mode. The reason I'm excited about this is because it means that the two UIs will maintain feature parity. The way it's set up right now, big picture mode rarely gets new features while desktop mode gets updated frequently. In the future, both should be updated regularly and simultaneously. The new virtual keyboards are sounding awesome as well. They support IME, which shows more care towards international languages, and there's also emoji support. They're obviously pushing for developers to use these virtual keyboards where appropriate in order to get deck verified, and I think that's a good move. 
We didn't see any of the keyboard themes yet, but I'm looking forward to see how those amplify the experience. And if I'm amplifying your experience with this video, be sure to hit the like button. If you'd like more Steam Deck and PC gaming content, subscribe and slap the bell. Number four, sleep mode is a first class citizen. Valve are doing everything they can to help developers support proper behavior when I put my device to sleep. Not only are they encouraging developers to ensure a game can have a friendly resume when the deck comes out of sleep mode, but they have implemented cloud saves and loads that could be triggered when the deck goes to sleep and wakes up respectively. So if I put my deck to sleep mid game, I can resume play from my desktop or set top box. Then the next time I fire up the deck and the game resumes, it will resume from the latest save available. In this stream, they didn't specify whether or not this feature is Linux only, but I suspect it is. Furthermore, a developer has to opt into the cloud suspend feature, so it will likely not be available for most games at launch. The final way that sleep mode is a first class citizen is that Valve has given a lot of consideration to using as little battery as possible while in sleep mode and implied that they are aiming for you to be able to come back to your device days later. We all know that sleep mode is going to be a determining factor on whether or not this is a top tier handheld. Valve agrees and the way they are treating it like a first class citizen has me optimistic. Number five, AAA gaming for 2022 and beyond is a priority. While Valve expects the deck to be a multi-generational device, there were several ways that they showed that they are aiming for the deck to be a machine that can play not just today's AAA games, but hopefully the AAA games for years to come. While the AMD APU deep dive segment was probably the segment where most non-developers tuned out, it was key in showing that tools for debugging and optimization are readily available today and in fact have been available for some time. The reason this is important is because most often, the developers looking to eke out every inch of GPU headroom possible are going to be the AAA developers. These developers have been made aware that they have robust graphical debugging tools that they can use to investigate everything from pipeline bottlenecks to V-blank events when running their game on Proton. Additionally, Valve indicated that 16 gigabytes of RAM is more than enough to run today's games on the deck, but that they went with that number in order to play games that will require more memory in the future. They also mentioned having a frame rate limiter and FSR support at the operating system level. Both of these can potentially be tools in the toolbox for reasonably running AAA games for years to come. Number six, don't expect SteamOS 3 and big picture mode before launch. In my video about the Steam Deck delay, one of my silver linings was that maybe we'll get a peek at SteamOS 3 and Big Picture Mode before the launch of the deck. Well, several times in this live stream, Valve indicated that they are focused on preparing these things for Steam Deck and that anything else like having SteamOS 3 run on arbitrary hardware was not a priority until after the launch of the deck. While that's disappointing for me, it's certainly understandable from Valve's point of view. They are entirely focused on Steam Deck from now until February at least. By the way, this also applies to the Deck Verified program. It's possible that they've already started rating games, but it seems like they're not keen on surfacing that data on a desktop store unless you have a Steam Deck. I don't know how they expect people to make a decision to buy a Steam Deck or not without having that data more readily available, so I do expect that to evolve a bit as we get closer to launch. So sadly, if you were looking to play with some of these things in 2021, you're out of luck and will likely have to wait until February and beyond. Number seven, developers can target Steam Deck in cool ways. Developers were shown a number of ways that they can target Steam Deck specifically. As we already knew, they have a function available to them in the Steam API that allows them to see if the current device is a Steam Deck. Valve recommends that they use this for things like graphical presets, but not for things like HUD layout. They would prefer that you use resolution for something like that since players may be playing docked. One new way we learned that developers could target the Steam Deck is by having a game download that's tailored to the deck. For example, you could use lower resolution assets like textures, audio, and movies to allow for a smaller download size and potentially improve performance. This could be great, especially when you're trying to download on the go. One more neat way to target the deck were the input glyphs that Valve created. Valve created glyphs for all of the major controllers, including the deck itself. That's pretty cool as developers could use these to specify deck only buttons like R4 and R5. Number eight, everything you needed to know about docked gaming. The live stream gave a pretty good showcase of what to expect from docked gaming. They mentioned that the USB Type-C port is capable of 45 watts, which if you're playing undocked is enough for max load gaming plus charging at a full rate with enough room for some external devices like controllers. If you use their dock, then you have enough throughput for two 4K monitors at 60 FPS. 
the OS level FSR capabilities that I mentioned before would of course be really helpful for playing at higher resolutions like you would do when docked. As far as internet speeds, the dock itself supports gigabit ethernet speed. I think my biggest concern here is how will the deck support transitioning a game that's currently running going from undocked to docked and vice versa. This is not usually a trivial matter since PC games don't always play nice with resolution changes that aren't initiated from the game itself. Number 9. Awesome Input Handling First of all, the new input configurator looks amazing. It looks more streamlined and a lot less intimidating than the current version. I still hope that I'm able to find the more advanced options if I need to, but I don't need them at the forefront. Developers are given a wealth of options for handling all of the input. Via Steam Input API, they are able to tell which controller the player is using and show that player the appropriate glyphs. There's also a game launcher mode that a developer can set to swap from normal controls to a mouse and keyboard like set of controls that would make navigating launchers and browsers possible without the use of the touchscreen. If an on-screen keyboard is needed for text entry, developers can also set a screen position for that keyboard in order to make sure they don't hide any game elements that should stay visible. Finally, developers are encouraged to set a default controller configuration so that we don't have to select the template from the community first the first time we play. And number 10, Australia and Japan should be next. While Valve were not willing to commit to a timeline when asked about worldwide distribution, they said that they hoped they would have more to share soon and that they are currently looking specifically at Australia and Japan as the next regions to get a Steam Deck. This feels like the first time they've even really addressed this as a problem and while they didn't really say much, it was good to hear them at least comment on the subject. So those are my top 10 things that we didn't know about the Steam Deck before the dev stream. There were a few smaller things we learned in the dev stream. We saw a portal themed Steam Deck prototype with an Aperture logo. That looks awesome, but of course, they're too focused on the current launch to really speak on future revisions with alternate colors. They also had a bit about SD card load times. I would have included it, but they described it as a single data point, and as a result, it didn't exactly fill me with confidence. One big thing they mentioned is that they know the current dev kits have some hardware issues like the sticky B button, and they said that's part of the reason for the dev kits, to find and iron out these issues. That was good to hear. Finally, they spoke of a spare parts store. Once again, they weren't ready to share any details, but they said they were committing to providing as many spare parts as possible. Let me know in the comments if you learned anything in this video, and as always, if you made it this far, you are a real one, and you may have heard this before. Like and subscribe, slap the bell to get notified, tell a friend it's a vibe, that gang out. Goodbye.